Buenas San Jafade, everyone. So glad to have you all here for this uh, 38th installment of the Presidential Lecture Series. And I'm, I'm so honored to have David Green here as our, um, as our uh, lecturer for the 38th um, Presidential Lecture. Uh, as you probably already know, David Green is an award-winning journalist and the host of National Public Radio's Morning Edition or as we think of it here, evening edition, since um, we're sort of um, out of sync. And he's also a uh, host of NPR's morning news podcast, Up First. Morning Edition is NPR's most popular program with an estimated 14.6 million listeners, according to the 2017 Nielsen ratings data. David Green spent nearly seven years as a newspaper reporter for the Baltimore Sun. He also served as a foreign correspondent based in Moscow covering the region from Ukraine and the Baltics uh, all the way east to Siberia, and then also as a White House correspondent during President George W. Bush's second term. He is a 1998 uh, magna cum laude graduate of Harvard University with a degree in government. He was the recipient of the White House Correspondents Association 2008 Merriman Smith Award for deadline coverage of the presidency and the 2011 Daniel Shore Journalism Prize from WBUR and Boston University for his coverage of the Arab Spring. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce David Green. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that really warm welcome, and thank you for this warm welcome. I feel stronger and more confident with a lay on. This is, this is the first time I've ever spoken wearing this, so I, this is, I, I want to do this all the time. Um, uh, thank you so much for, for having me and uh, for your interest uh, this afternoon. It, it really means a, a great deal. Um, I, I, I want to start by saying that I'm here at, at what sounds like a, a really painful day. Um, I know uh, you've lost a, a legend in broadcasting, John Anderson, this morning. Um, and uh, I am sad to say I never had the chance to meet him. It sounds like someone who I would have learned a great deal from. Um, in the field of broadcast, I think more than any other field, you learn from legends. Uh, and I have known that at NPR. Um, and so, as I hear people talk about the power and influence he had uh, here and in this region, the entire field of broadcast, uh, it, it sounds like a day that we should all be, all be mourning. Um, so I'm, I'm going to use the opportunity to, to learn more about his legacy and, and learn from him in any way I possibly can, because it sounds like so many, so many people have done that in this field. And, and so please know that I, I mourn along with you today the, the, the loss of someone so important. Uh, when, um, when Chris Hardig, who's the GM of our fabulous member station here, KPRG, called me uh, in October to talk to me about coming, I asked him uh, how he was doing. And he said, well, it's not the best day. Um, we were just hit with a massive typhoon. And you know, I had read an introduction uh, on our show that morning. Um, about you two and the the destruction that it had caused, and it was just a thirty second intro to a piece, and then you know I went went on with the rest of the show, and you know being here now and you know knowing that that I am in a a, a part of my country, um, it was a long a long journey, but to begin to understand you know, a story that was so huge and catastrophic uh, that to me, sitting in that studio in Los Angeles that morning was just a 30 second introduction. You know, it, it causes me to really reflect on, um, you know, the priorities uh, in journalism today, the stories we should be covering and should be paying attention to and the stories that maybe are not so important. Um, and so I really appreciated the chance to to reflect on that, and already in the 24 hours here, uh, you know, I'm learning a lot from from you and from Guam in ways that, that maybe are going to shape how approach, I approach my job every single day. So it's it's been a wonderful visit. Uh, my wife Rose is here with me, sitting in the front row. Uh, 
I'm very lucky to be married to someone uh, like her. Um, she's my life partner. She's my best friend. Um, she's my travel buddy. Uh, she has this curiosity and passion for meeting new people and visiting new places just like I do. And uh, she inspires me every day on, on trips like this. Uh, she owns two restaurants in Washington, D.C., one of which was uh, just named the second best new restaurant in the entire country uh, by Bon Appetit magazine. I'm allowed to brag because she's my wife. Uh, and so, you know, it's funny, we're in two very different professions, um, but they're the same in many ways. You know, she believes that, you know, serving food in her restaurants is so much more than about food. It's about you know, the stories and people behind these cuisines and these cultures. And I'm telling stories every day and trying to understand people and places in, in a whole new way. Uh, and so it's trips like this, you know, we really, really feel fortunate to have the opportunity to, to visit um, hospitable and fascinating places like Guam. So I can't tell you what it means to be here. You're really upping my game, too, in, in my marriage and partnership because, you know, I think about the, the places that we go for her work. Uh, you know, she's taken me to Beirut to study food and culture, and I've taken her to Minsk to cover a revolution that nearly injured us because there were people on the streets with, you know, batons. Um, and I had to call her and be like, honey, maybe you should go inside the hotel right now because this is a lot of unrest. Uh, you know, she's taken me to places like Bolivia and the soaring mountains um, of South America. And I've taken her to Crawford, Texas um, when I was covering George W. Bush's presidency, which is a, a far cry from Bolivia. Uh, I think uh, the, the toughest place I probably took her uh, with me to was uh, Siberia. Um, I spent uh, two and a half years uh, as Moscow correspondent for NPR um, and decided that to learn about that country, I wanted to cross the country on the Trans-Siberian Railway, not once but twice, because it was that much fun. Um, and she came with me, and uh, on one of the, one of the trips, uh, I forgot to tell her that we that I decided to travel in third class to really get a sense for Russian life. <laughs> and third class on a Russian train is, it's kind of, it's kind of like a dormitory um, you, with, you know, not just four people sharing a room. I mean, I shared, you know, a room with one other student where, when I was in college, but it's like, you know, 60 people on bunk beds together in one big room, which is fine if you're in your 20s and you're, you know, coming up um, through Central Asia into Russia looking for construction jobs. You know, it's kind of a fun adventure. But when you're a married couple um, trying to take a, a you know, trip across Siberia together, it's not the best. She, she fought through it. I remember sitting there on one of the bunks and she took out her iPhone and started taking video of the scene and talking into the, into the phone, um, saying that, you know, dear future children, this is what your father did to me. And the fact, that, the fact that you're here means that he lived to tell after he put me on this train. <clears throat> uh, but it's, it is trips like that, traveling across you know, a Trans-Siberian train, when I think that you truly, truly learn about a country and a culture. And you know, the, the two and a half years I spent as Moscow correspondent for NPR, you know, it was like the best job in the world. Um, you know, for one thing, I got to wake up every morning and decide where I wanted to go tell a story. You know, I was covering the entire former Soviet Union, so I could be in, in Belarus, like in Minsk, or I could be thousands of miles away in Vladivostok on the Pacific. Uh, I could be in Central Asia. Um, you know, it was just endless, the number of stories that, that I could cover. And I really learned that the story of a place is in the stories of its people. And, you know, too often I think we can forget that and get lost in the headlines, making assumptions about a country and a place and its leaders, all of which are, are so, so important as well. But, you know, really understanding people and the, their hopes and the decisions they make 
you know, when I went to serve in, in Russia, I look back now and I, I feel a little naive because I still was the, the teenager growing up as the Soviet Union was falling, believing that everyone in this world just wants American style democracy. And it's just a matter of time before every culture and every country will, will decide that it's the moment for that. Um, and, you know, spending time in Russia, you know, I got the chance to meet so many people who opened my eyes to, to different desires and different, you know, thirsts for different kinds of, of political systems um, and, and different instincts and different hopes. And, and that was really fascinating to me, understanding that there is so much more nuance to this world than I think sometimes we capture. I, one of the, the most defining moments was a community called Sagra, uh, which is in the Ural Mountains in Russia. And it was, it's a small town near the city of Yekaterinburg. And what fascinated me about visiting this you know, snow-covered village was something that had happened. Uh, there was a gang that had been you know, increasing their presence in this village because the timber industry was very strong, there was a lot of money there, and so this gang was coming in and trying to tap into this industry. And increasingly, the local population was, was trying to defend themselves and keep this gang away from them and their families. And there was one day when this gang was coming up the road into Sagra, and you know, by word of mouth, reports started getting back to the village of Sagra that this gang was on its way in. And so a lot of the residents mobilized, and they came out with, you know, they came out fighting, and, and they fought the gang off. And it sounded like something like a standoff at the OK Corral in the streets of Sagra. But they were able to fight off uh, this criminal gang and and get them to go away. And I, I there was there was one um, reported death of one of the gang members. But very quickly, uh, a lot of the residents of Sagra were charged with hooliganism. And who knows why? You know, there's so much corruption in the police in Russia that it's never clear who's being charged and why. But generally, when you're charged with a crime in Russia, um, that's pretty much the end of the the end of the process. You don't get a fair hearing in court. Uh, you know, you're headed for jail. And the residents in Sagra decided they weren't going to stand for that. And so they rose up and they hired an attorney and they essentially took truth to power. And they kept pushing this message that the residents of Sagra were only defending themselves, that they were not doing anything illegal. And this miraculous thing happened. They won. You know, they overcame the corruption, they overcame the power structures in this region, and a lot of the residents were exonerated. And so that was the backdrop when, when Rose and I and, and some of my colleagues got to Sagra. And so I'm thinking to myself, God, what a lesson in democracy. Like, this has to be the, the eye-opening moment in Sagra when everyone is going to be thinking, like, you know, you tell the truth, you get the truth out, you take truth to power. Like, this is what, this is what democratic rights and freedoms are all about. And one of the residents, uh, his name is Andrei Gorodilov. He was the son of uh, one of the, the Sagra residents who had been charged. And we hung out with his family drinking vodka, lots and lots of vodka. Uh, and I was talking politics with him. And, you know, I said this very thing. I was like, wow, you must have gone through something that was transformative for you. Like, you know, you, you just had this huge lesson in democracy. And he just wasn't sold at all. You know, he said, is, you know, is, is your system of democracy in the United States perfect? And I was like, I mean, no, but we're, you know, we're free. And there's a lot of value in that. And he said, well, look, look at what's happening in Libya right now. I mean, after the fall of Gaddafi, you know, is that country any better? I mean, all these outside forces came in thinking like, well, let's bring democracy to Libya. And he said, that's not going that well. I'm terrified of that kind of chaos and instability. 
And you know, we had this long conversation. I said, well, you know, maybe the fight for democracy is, is long, and, you know, but it's worth it in the end. And you know, I believe firmly in the system that we have. And he you know, was incredibly persuasive when he talked about you know, a much slower march to, to a better system and, and you know, more rights for people. And I realized that I, you know, this is a much more complicated, nuanced conversation than I think I ever expected. And eventually, he, he looked at me and he's like, look, let me just ask you this. You talk about American-style democracy, and, and this was, you know, was pre-2016 election, but um, he was like, you know, there's, there's talk of Hillary Clinton maybe running for president uh, again. There's talk of Jeb Bush. You know, I think about Bush, Clinton, Clinton, Bush, Bush, Obama, Obama, and then either Clinton, Clinton, or Bush, Bush. He was like, is that a democracy? I was like, okay, that's a good point, interesting. And he was like, and what in heaven's name is the Electoral College? And I was like, okay, you got a good point. Um, so all of this is to say that, that those kinds of conversations and learning the layers of nuance beneath the oversimplified sort of headlines, you know, it's not just a multiple choice. It's not that you march into a country and say, you know, to its people, well, you know, do you want democracy or do you want to have basically a dictator? Like, you choose. Uh, the world is so much more complicated, and that's what I learned from serving in a place like Moscow for two and a half years. And I think back to that conversation with the Gorodilov family so often, because we were sitting there talking about politics and different political systems and having these disagreements over vodka and cured meat. And it was so pleasant. And I think about our politics in the United States today, and those kinds of conversations, they just don't seem to happen as much as they used to. And I think to myself, like, what, who are we today? That you know, it seems so much more difficult to actually sit and disagree and have like a civil discourse like that. And as I reflect on that, I think about the role that I want to be playing in 2019, you know, as a journalist and as the host of a show. And you know, there are a lot of important roles and a lot of parts of my mission that, that are so important. I mean, it is holding a government accountable. Um, it is telling stories in the f in you know that are absolutely fair and truthful. Um, but it's also fostering dialogue and creating a space, you know, on the air um, where people can disagree and try and understand one another. And I feel like that part of our mission as journalists is so much more important today than it ever has been. I think back to covering the 2016 election and our show started a project that we called Divided States. And we wanted to do very much what I'm talking about. Uh, we went to four different states, and we timed our trips right around each of the three presidential debates and then the vice presidential debate. And we would go in um, to a state a couple days before the debate, and we chose four different voters. Um, and we made you know, the groups very diverse um, in all ways, including politically. And we profiled you know, these four voters. And on the morning of the debate on our program, you would meet these four voters. And then we asked all of them to watch the debate that night and then come in the next morning live um, into a studio uh, near their homes. And we would host the show from there and talk to them about what they thought about the debate the night before. And so I was assigned to go to Arizona. And one of the voters we chose was a woman named Eileen Eager. And she was, she advertised herself online as the best darn realtor in Tucson. And she's the most lovely, charming person you could ever meet with a really inspiring story. She talked to me about having been in Chicago, single mom, and she would go out on dates, not to try and find a partner, but she would eat like, a third or a half of a steak and then bring the rest of it home for her kids. Like that was the way she would be able to, to feed her family. Uh, 
she eventually moved to Arizona and had gotten married. And so she was one of the voters we brought in. She was supporting uh, Donald Trump. And I was talking to her and asking her you know, about uh, President Trump's proposed travel ban on some Muslim-majority uh, countries. And she said something that sort of startled me. Um, she said that Muslims, in many cases, are here in the United States to kill us. And I you know, had a lot of things on my mind after she said that. Um, you know, I said, you know, it sounds like you're discriminating against an entire religion. And she held her ground and said, well, I mean, this is the way I feel. I'm, I'm afraid. And I said, you know, the statistics actually show that the majority of mass killings in the United States are carried out by white men. Um, does that allay your fears at all? And she said, no, no, not really. So I, you know, I challenged her on her view um, in a lot of different ways. Uh, did not feel that it was my role as a journalist to, like, you know, start hitting the telephone and saying, why do you feel this way? But you know, it was, it's my job to, to challenge her on, on a, a view like that, and one that's, that's very controversial, um, and many would say hateful. And so that conversation aired. Um, the vice presidential debate happened, and she came into our studios in Phoenix the next morning with three other voters, and she was carrying this pile of emails, and she, like, put them down on the table. I was like, oh, what, what is that? She was like, these are the emails from your listeners. I mean, she had gotten death threats, I mean, just, I mean, with, with language that you couldn't possibly imagine. And she actually at one point said to me, you know, she knew that a lot of people had said that Donald Trump had used a lot of, you know, pretty tough, uh, controversial language during the course of his campaign, and she said, what your listeners are saying to me in these emails are like nothing that Donald Trump has ever uttered, you know, in, in his entire candidacy. And so, I have a couple thoughts about this because one was we took our show and me, we took a tremendous amount of criticism for airing her views. A lot of people said you should never put such hateful viewpoints on the air. Um, and in addition to that, the other thing that I really reflected on was the reaction of the three other voters because both while we were on live and while the microphones were turned off, you know, they challenged her and they said they could not disagree more with her view of Muslims in the United States. And they tried to educate her and they tried to explain why they thought she should be more tolerant. And they heard her out and she heard them out. And there was something beautiful happening. And so, you know, I left that morning feeling like we had done our job at a moment when a lot of Americans disagreed about political candidates and about issues. You know, we aired, you know, a really difficult viewpoint for many people to hear, you know, but it was about a candidate and a policy who a lot of people had very strong views about. And we created a space for a dialogue to happen, to confront something difficult together and not hide from it. And it's tough for me because I am never going to tell you or our listeners and our audience what to think or how to think. And I also can never put myself in the shoes who have, of someone who is facing discrimination and discriminatory language like that. Um, so I would never tell anyone to be angry or not to be angry or how angry to be or how much to feel pain or how much to be offended. Um, but what I can do is just look for the moments to allow for conversations to happen when people want to have them. And that is the role that I feel like I can play today as a journalist. And this came up yet again very recently. Um, there was what is now a, a famous confrontation uh, outside the Lincoln Memorial. Um, and a, a tribal elder named Nathan Phillips uh, was in Washington for uh, an indigenous people's march. Um, and there was a group of high school students from Kentucky who were there for 
uh, the March for Life. Um, and I'm sure you, many of you have seen this on, on viral videos, but there was a moment when Nathan Phillips was standing there and singing and banging his drum, and a student from this high school in Kentucky was staring him in the face as a lot of other students were doing what seemed like a mockery of him. But there were so many different views of what was happening, you know, based, it seemed largely on, on what sort of feelings you brought to these, these videos that, that we were all seeing. I mean, what a testament to, you know, this age of social media um, and how, quote unquote, news spreads. But we invited him, Mr. Phillips, onto our air um, two mornings after this happened. And I had a really raw, live conversation with him, asking him, you know, how he felt, what he saw, what he heard, what he was hoping to accomplish, what he thought these students were doing. And, you know, I was attacked angrily by a lot of our listeners for challenging him too much, for not challenging him enough, for not asking tough enough questions, for being mean to him, for being too easy on him. And then we had uh, a state lawmaker from Kentucky who had graduated from the high school come on talking about basically defending the students. Um, and I was criticized for asking questions that were too hard and for being too easy on him and for the fact that we had these two voices on our air at all. And, you know, I take that, that kind of criticism um, I try and, and brush it off, but, but it's hard to because it, it's questioning everything you are as, as a journalist. But I would defend both of those interviews and I would defend our decision to have those two guests on talking about this moment. And it was a moment that captured the attention of a lot of Americans. And you know, in the days after this happened, um, Nathan Phillips said something really meaningful. He, he released a statement as he's been thinking about this a lot. And he said, I have faith that human beings can use a moment like this to find a way to gain understanding from one another. And what powerful words from someone who had clearly gone through something that he felt was really painful and, and offensive. And I, I realize in reading those words that I have that same faith in, in us as Americans, in us as voters, in us as people who care about our country and our families and our future. And this is a really loud and difficult time and, and a really confusing time. But I have that faith that we really can come to an understanding once we hear each other out. And especially in these times, always, but especially in these times, the more I can create those opportunities to listen to one another in a civil way and to share views and to challenge one another and to work stuff out together. You know, if I can wake up every day feeling like I'm doing that, I'll feel like I am doing my job. So those are just a few thoughts about my life and profession. Um, and I, uh, I'm gonna leave it there and, and take whatever questions you have and you know, feel free to, to bring up anything. Um, but I, I just really, really appreciate the opportunity to to share this space with you and, and to chat about this and to share some thoughts. So thank you very much. We'll, we will now open uh, the floor for questions. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. We have microphones on either side of the, the lecture hall. If anybody has a question. Hello. So um, my question is about like when you're interviewing someone and like you already have your list of questions to go into the interview and then the person you're interviewing, let's say it's a politician, they feel uncomfortable answering some of your questions and then like your interview, it feels like it's not going anywhere. Uh, what advice would you give to that kind of situation? There's a small, terrified part of me that wants to say, just hide under the desk and pretend like it's not happening. That's not the advice I would give. But that just speaks to um, how difficult moments like that can be. And, and I really mean that. Um, we've, we have been doing, in the last three or four years, a lot more live radio and live interviews than ever before. 
and it's it's invigorating. Um, I think it can be more dynamic, but I'm not going to lie, it's also really scary. And so the biggest piece of advice I would give you, and it's funny to even say this because it should be so so easy, but it's actually so hard. It's listening. Because listening should be the thing that comes naturally in, in this line of work. But, I mean, you actually pointed to, to part of the, of the challenge because you come in with a list of questions and let's say I know that I have seven minutes to ask you know, a list of questions that I, that I want to ask. So all these distractions are there. I've got my list and I'm thinking like, well, how, I mean, I really want to get to question five, but you know, she seems to be answering question two and this seems like a really good answer and I don't want to interrupt her, but like I really want to get to question five. That's 10 seconds that I have not been listening to a word she's saying. And then I'm sitting there looking at this clock, and I'm like, okay, the 4.37 left in the clock, and we're only on question two, and now I really want to get to question four, and like, should I ask a challenge? Again, now I'm not listening to a word she's saying. Um, and so actually engaging and making sure you are listening is the single, the single most important piece of advice I can give, but it comes with the caveat that it is not easy at all. And so trying to get rid of the distractions and actually listening you know, is, is crucial. Um, and your list is only so important. Like there are some interviews where I'll go in with the list and I'll imagine the way a conversation is gonna happen and you know, top, the first topic will lead really naturally to the second topic, which leads naturally to the third topic. And I'll even be like, whew, I'm glad I like, envisioned the conversation that way because that's the way it kind of went. But you never know. Like if I'm interviewing you, you might say something that is so important in your life and you are so passionate about it and it's worth just throwing away the five other questions I had to really you know, drill down and understand why you're feeling something, you know, why you're happy about this or why it's painful to you. And so to allow for those natural moments is also really, really important. Um, and just to, to to dig at your question a little more specifically, I think if someone is not answering your question, you know, it depends in some ways on who the guest is. You know, if, for example, I'm interviewing uh, a lawmaker um, and you know, he or she has supported uh, or voted for or against a bill and, and the position that he or she has taken is like, really controversial, you know, and I, the one question that I feel I need to get to to serve our listeners is why you voted that way. Um, and this person is just evading left and right. That's where I might, you know, really push hard and four or five minutes into the seven minutes say something like, you know what, I, I sense that you don't want to answer this question. It's really important. Like, I'm going to ask one more time, why did you vote no? Because our listeners need to know the answer to this. But on the other hand, if it's not someone who is in public office um, and there's not this like, need for me to fulfill my mission of accountability, I'm going to be much less aggressive and, and less stubborn about getting the answer to, to a question, if that makes sense. So, so some of it might depend on the guest. Did that answer your question? <laughs> OK, yeah, that, that's the advice. I have. But listening, listening is really the most important. Yeah. Hi, David. About 20 years ago, I was in Senator Inouye's, Hawaii Senator Inouye's office, and he was talking about how he and some of the older guys, Dole and Kennedy, could have these fights on, on the floor of Congress, and then like, oh man, we got to get to dinner, and they'd leave it, and they would go have, and they would have a friendship. And, and I'm thinking that maybe the World War II generation had this shared experience that allowed them to kind of work through things. And then there was the issue of pork that was taken out um, during the Obama administration. So now Congress doesn't have any reason to cross the aisle and make deals like the old days. Do you see that kind of the way things are? Yeah, 100%. I, I would add another layer to it. Um, I mean, and actually with, with my wife having two restaurants in Washington, like it, we talk, she and I talk about this a lot, that Washington used to be 
a place where you would do it exactly what you're talking about. I mean, you'd have these ferocious debates on the floor, sometimes playing to the cameras, and you would all go to a restaurant in Washington together and like be friends. And a lot more lawmakers lived in the district and had those opportunities and weren't flying home every weekend and not, you know, not spending that time with one another. Yeah, I 100%. I, I, I think about that with, you know, you think about the relationship right now between Trump and Pelosi. It's like we're watching that play out, but if you think back to other times in the history of American politics, you know, there might be people from the White House or the president, you know, having those meetings behind the scenes in Washington with a very powerful speaker, you know, and working stuff out. And and that just doesn't seem to be part of the fabric of American politics anymore. And I think a lot of political scientists would, you know, could talk forever about this, whether it's been the gerrymandering of districts, whether it's we're seeing members who are voted by just their base on either side serving in office and there are so few moderates now. But no, there, there's no impetus for deal making. Um, and it seems like elections, at least the two parties seem to believe that elections are won by mobilizing the base. Um, and when your base voters are that important in your mind, you know, what is the incentive to actually make deals? If you, in your mind, are thinking, every time I make a deal with the other side, I'm less likely to win my next election. So it's an, it's an enormous problem. Um, but, you know, I, I, I don't think, you know, I, I think part of it is, is the politics, but I think, I think you point to what is, what might be the most significant change in Washington in many ways in the last 20, 30 years, which is that there's no incentive to make a deal and there aren't those types of interactions that might happen at a restaurant or bar in the evening because everyone's flying home. And it's sad. Like it was it was more it was more fun to cover Washington when there was more civility and greater respect for the other side. And and I'm not as a journalist, I'm not pointing the finger at, at one side or the other. I'm just noting that that Washington DC is a very different place today than than it was, you know, when I first arrived and started being a journalist. Thanks. I had a couple of questions, and the first is quick. Did you learn to play Durak on Russian trains? Did I what? Learn to play the card game Durak. No, I saw a lot of oh, Russians no, playing, no, but I never it. learned. Do you okay. know how to play it? Yes, I, I learned on Russian trains. Well, if you, I mean, if you have time <laughs> afterwards, maybe we can yeah, have some Durak we can, lessons. We can, we can do a lesson. Uh, the other question I had was about journalists and, and journalism, because it's a really difficult moment right now for journalism, a lot of journalists are losing their jobs, physicians are disappearing, and local, particularly local outlets are having trouble. How, this is a long trajectory, but do you see this changing? Do I see this ending well, whatever's happening yeah, right now? Yeah, yeah, is, is journalism, is it, particularly at the local level, is it just gonna, I guess, vanish? Mm -hmm. um, so, I don't blame anyone for feeling like that the, that the world is ending when it comes to journalism, because it's been, it has seemed that bad at moments. Uh, I, I could talk about this for an hour. I will try to limit my answer. Um, but, so I was at the Baltimore Sun for seven years, and I left at a time when that paper was literally on the cliff, and, and it has fallen over. Um, I mean, there are people who work there still today who I respect deeply and still read. But that was a paper that you know had five foreign bureaus, had like 20 people in Washington, and had this amazing reputation, and the Baltimore Sun is just a shell of its former self. And, but in relation to some newspapers that have closed down, uh, you know, at least it's still operating, but the number of newspaper jobs that have been lost in the United States in the last decade or two, it's just astonishing. And that means that there are so many communities where public officials are not being held accountable, where people are not you know, learning about what's happening in their community um, from stories that are told in fair and accurate ways, but it's more just word of mouth and you know, people who have a position or an ax to grind. It's really, really scary. Um, there are things that give me optimism that it is going to end well. You know, I think there's, there's something happening today. You, you talk to a lot of younger people when I speak to them. Um, 
some of the things they say worry me, like that they get their quote unquote news from places that I don't consider news organizations. I think we have to really work hard to reclaim what news is and what the definition of that is. But I think a lot of people seem to be feeling like the media environment has gotten so insanely crowded that they're beginning to look again for those reliable sources. And that feels like a positive course correction. And so the question becomes, what are those reliable sources? Um, I think about the newspaper world, you know, the New York Times, the Washington Post. I mean, those institutions are doing some of the best work right now than they ever have. Um, we would not know what was happening in, in Washington and in this administration were it not for papers like that doing this extraordinary watchdog journalism. And then I think about my field. Um, I mean, honestly, like the model that is public radio has always been you know, really important to our country, I believe, but it feels like it is more important today than ever. I mean, I am traveling to, you know, public radio communities where newspapers have fallen apart and you have journalists who have been lost their jobs at newspapers coming and forming partnerships with public radio stations, you know, to increase their staff. And so you have this wonderful thing where you have, you know, these experienced veteran print journalists who are coming into newsrooms and you're sharing all of this talent, you know, all at these public radio member stations that, that are growing in terms of staff. And, you know, I think about KPRG here. Um, I mean, Chris Hardig is sitting right here. He's the GM. And what he pulled off, for example, to get, you know, back on the air after the typhoon and to start informing people again on Saipan, I mean, it just sounds like an incredible feat. I mean, you know, I get emotional just thinking about the effort that he and his staff made to do that. And that is local journalism at its finest. But it's not just serving the public radio community here, you know, by getting back on the air in a terrifying moment like that. But he's also airing content from us. I mean, so you think about what reliable source, you know, people are craving at a moment where it feels so chaotic, but also interconnected, where people want to know what's happening and, you know, on a moment's notice, not just in their community, not just you know, in their region, not just in their country, but in the world as well. Where can you get that entire combination, feel connected to your community, and feel like you really have a news organization that is part of the fabric of your community, but it's actually informing you about everything and you can trust? I mean, that's why I wake up you know, really proud of where I work every day and more hopeful than, than I was, say, like five years ago, because I, I feel like you know, there are institutions like the Washington Post, like the New York Times, that have survived and are thriving again. And then there are institutions like ours that are sort of made for this moment when you know, younger audiences, all audiences, but you know, particularly you're seeing the change in younger audiences who love this vast new world of social media and the chaos and the crowded um, the crowded environment, but they're they're getting more and more to a place where it's like, okay, in all this, like, who can I trust? And that, to me, gives me hope. I think we have time for one more question. Hello. Uh, sadly, we've heard news about uh, journalists being killed around the world while they're reporting on on news that perhaps important people, uh, you know, presidents, dictators, uh, don't want don't want those news to come out. Um, what does that do to a journalist to be in front of that decision? You know, do I take a story because I want to tell the truth? Um, do I pass it on because I'm fearful for my own life or my family's life? Um, and I, I think we've heard a lot more in the past, maybe five, ten years, but what does that do to a journalist to have to be confronted with a situation like that? Um, it's, it's horrible. Uh, and I think it's, it's such a personal decision in terms of the risk and the sacrifice you want to make. I, you know, there's no, there's no rule book or guide for that. Um, you know, being in Russia, uh, 
being an American journalist in Russia, you know, I was followed by the Russian security forces and they definitely kept tabs on me. But it was nothing like the risk that Russian journalists took. I mean, if you are a Russian journalist and you start investigating, you know, corruption or business dealings or anything that gets close to the Kremlin, I mean, you are immediately risking your life. Uh, you know, Rose and I were in Russia when a reporter for a Commerçant newspaper um, was writing about a lot of corruption uh, over this highway project and he was beaten outside his home and he was a newspaper reporter so he typed and they bashed his fingers as much as they possibly could which was clearly like to take away his ability to do his job. And so I, I mean, I was in awe of journalists in a country like Russia you know, making the sacrifices. And, you know, I don't want to speak for them, but I think they would say, like, they, you know, if, if, if they're not going to be carrying out this important duty and getting to the truth in their own country with the future of their country on their minds, who's going to do it? You know, I personally had the opportunity to go be NPR's Baghdad bureau chief and briefly agreed to take the job. Um, and then a colleague of mine at NPR had a very close call in Iraq as I was getting ready to go. The NPR car was right so outside a, a shop where he was doing interviews. And he came out with the NPR team and a, a police officer was running up, de up the street yelling, don't get in the car, don't get in the car. They all stepped back and I mean the car just blew up before their eyes. And fortunately they were all fine. But I happened to be with Rose at the time and I, I just started crying and I was like, I'm not, I'm not, going to take this job. And one of the best pieces of advice I got was from our senior executive news editor at the time. And she said to me, you're no less a person and you're no less a journalist for not wanting to take this risk. You know, don't feel like you have to be some kind of cowboy. Don't feel like you have to be a risk taker. Um, you know, you can be a successful journalist and a brave, courageous journalist without doing that. And that was really meaningful to me. But then I would watch, you know, many of my colleagues who have put themselves in, in harm's way in war zones. Um, you know, we lost a, a dear friend um, named David Gilkey, who was the photographer for NPR. He was killed in Afghanistan several years ago. And, you know, few days go by when I don't think about him. Um, and, you know, I had a lot of long talks with David about what drew him to war coverage. And, you know, his photographs are some of the most powerful I've ever seen from countries at war, uh, especially people serving in the military, because he, he caught the very human face of military service. And he got to know um, a lot of the, the US forces who were serving in places like Afghanistan. and you could see the anguish and conflict and determination and emotions on their faces in these photos like, like no other photos I'd ever seen. And David had that knack. And so he has left us with this gift of documenting you know, these wars and, and the sacrifice. Um, and then he made his own sacrifice. And it's, it, you know, it truly breaks my heart. But I don't know, like I think he was in a weird way like ready for that to happen if it was going to happen because it meant so much to him to capture those images. And so it, it is, it's sort of impossible to describe and also I think it's just such a personal decision. But you know, I guess all I'll say is the risk is real uh, and I'm in awe of everyone who, you know, who puts their lives at risk to do this job. Yeah, thank thank you, you all so much. I really, this was, I really appreciate you listening. Thank you.